Uh, welcome to the 2021 Siemens Digital Symposium. Uh, this is the fundamentals of rotating machinery section. We'll be covering uh, the fundamentals of orders, what an order actually is. We'll talk about torsional vibration, and we'll also talk about how to measure uh, the RPM using multiple pulses per rev and uh, encoder. Uh, so we'll provide some tips there. I'm Scott Beebe. I'm an application engineer here with Siemens. Uh, joining me will be Chris Paulson. And Chris, I'll let you introduce yourself. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are. My name is Chris Paulson. I'm a colleague of Scott, uh, also an application engineer, but I'm on the simulation side. And as Scott likes to joke, uh, when I'm not around, I'm the skater and pot off all my work on him. That's right. That's right. But that's okay, because we enjoy working together and we'll be able to show you some things in this presentation, how simulation and test uh, can be, simulation and test information can be shared across platforms. Um, to increase the collaboration and uh, make things work work better together. All right, so you ready to dive in, Chris? Yeah, let's go for it. And in true to form, I'm gonna sit back and let you present the first part of the presentation. <laughs> Sounds good. So like we said, we're gonna start with uh, orders and what an order is. So we're gonna talk about some order fundamentals. So to understand things first, let's talk about this guy shown on the screen. His name is Joseph Fourier, and he came up with something called the Fourier Transform. And the Fourier Transform is useful to us because it lets us convert any real world signal, any measured signal, into a unique combination of sine waves. And then we can look at these sine waves in what we call the frequency domain to garner more information um, from our measurements. And the nice thing about the Fourier transform is no information is lost when we do this conversion from the time domain to the frequency domain. And we can even convert back from the frequency domain to the time domain and never lose any information. So if we look here at the screen, and I'll get a laser pointer going, you can see this measured time signal here. And if we break that time signal into its individual sinusoidal components, we can look at the frequency and amplitude here in the frequency domain to figure out more what's going on with the products that we're measuring. So knowing that, let's look at some basics of sine waves. So if we have this displayed sine wave, Chris, and I were to say to you, what's the frequency? What would be your answer? I think two. Yeah, it's two hertz because we have this sine wave and the period of the sine wave repeats itself twice within one second. So we would call that two hertz. Now we're going to be talking about orders, which is something that happens uh, in terms of cycles or rotation. So we could say that two hertz is actually two cycles per second as well. And if I take this signal and modify it uh, to the signal on the right, what's happened here, Chris? It looks like, let's see, you doubled the frequency. That's right, yeah. So I kept the amplitude the same, but I doubled the frequency. And this one here, kind of keeping things simple. Let's see, that one. You've doubled the amplitude. That's right, it's double the amplitude. So like I said, we're gonna start easy and just build on this. So now that we've talked about amplitude a little bit, if I were to ask you, Chris, what was the amplitude of this signal, what might your first answer be? Uh, I would say 10, but I might not be providing enough information. Well, if you said 10, I could agree with that, but I might, you know, want to raise. And if I have to report a lower amplitude, I'll say five. And technically we're both right because an amplitude of five would represent a peak value. An amplitude of 10 would be peak to peak. There's even a third way of reporting this amplitude, and that's the RMS value, which is here, 0 0.707 of the peak, or 3.5. So all three of these answers are correct. The thing to note here is that we just want to be on the same page when we're talking about amplitudes of signals. So whether it's peak to peak or peak, we just want to kind of talk the same language, so to speak. So all this to get to what's in order. So here's the definition. An order is a vibration or acoustic response of a structure due to a rotating component. Okay, 
So let's, again, start simple. If we have this, uh, let's say, engine with just one rotating component, it's just a simple shaft, we can measure that using an acquisition system and we can um, use a tachometer on the shaft to, to calculate the speed and we can measure the uh, vibration or sound using an accelerometer or a microphone. So if we look at just that shaft and I spin that shaft at 600 RPM, what's the frequency there, Chris? Any guesses? Well, I'm going to have to go with the best guess, which is the answer to the universe and everything, which is 48. 48? So that's 48. not right. But we have the <sighs> rotations per minute, and we want to get to frequency, which is cycles per second, like we said. So if we do some quick math, we can get to the cycles per second, or 10 revolutions per second. So we could say at 600 RPM, the frequency of this shaft is 10 hertz. Now... We Got can it. plot the given amplitude that we measure there, and we could put that on a plot here where it's just frequency versus amplitude, like what we've been talking about, right? Exactly. And if we increase the speed to 6,000 RPM, I'm going to give you a hint here, Chris. It's not 48, but what would be the frequency at this speed? The frequency of that speed would be... Uh, a hundred. You increase it by ten. So right. Yep. So it would be a hundred hertz. hertz. Yeah. Hundred hertz. And we could plot the amplitude there that we measure at a hundred hertz as well. Now, if we make it a little more complicated and we spin it at a speed in between six hundred and six thousand, let's say thirty-three hundred RPM, the frequency here can again be calculated, and let's say it's fifty-five hertz. We take that amplitude and we plot that as well. Now I'm going to add a third axis to the plot we've been talking about. So now we have RPM, which is our, our measured speed, amplitude, and frequency. And we've measured the frequency for 600, 3500, and 6000 RPM. And we can plot those values uh, on this plot here, this three-dimensional plot. And then we can fill in the other speeds here and ultimately connect the dots across the peaks. Then we can look at this plot across just two axes, two axes, and those two axes would be speed and amplitude, and then we would call that something. This has a name, and this would be first order. This first order is in relation to that measured shaft. And if we look at that first order across this, the speed and amplitude axes, we could call that first order. Now, there's something unique about this first order plot that I'll point out here. You can see as the speed increases, the amplitude or the noise increases, but then it actually dips here for a little bit. And when it dips, that's kind of counterintuitive because we would think that as the speed increases, the energy in the system would also increase. Any idea as to why that might dip along the speed there, Chris? No, but I'm sure you can educate me. Yeah, so when we spin the shaft, it's obviously in a structure. And we could be exciting resonant frequencies along the way that are adding to the, the measured vibration and then getting past a resonant frequency where uh, the energy in the system actually dips. And so when we look at orders, they're not always sloped up. They might go up and down because there's other things going on that we'll have to look at in the system as well. Now let's make our system a little more complicated and let's add a second shaft. So if we add a second shaft here, shaft two, and we say that the pulley ratio is three to one. We're gonna still spin shaft one at 600 RPM. And to keep things simple, what would be the RPM for shaft two? Will it be three? Oh wait, I know that. Oh, go I ahead, know Chris. that. That's, that's a mechanical system I model all the time with, uh, with motion. So basically since your uh, one shaft, the other shaft spins at three times the first shaft, the second shaft is spinning at three times 600 RPM or 1800 RPM. You got it. That's right. And if I were to ask the frequency for shaft two, what would that be? That would be three times the frequency of shaft one, which yep. is 30 hertz. You got it. So we can do kind of the same exercise we did before and go through these given speeds for shaft one and shaft two and plot the amplitudes at each frequency. And then we can go back to that three-dimensional plot we had before and plot the same type of values for shaft two. And once we get the amplitudes across all those speeds and frequencies, then we have another line here, or another cut, let's say. And this also has a name. What would that be, Chris? 
So if shaft one was first order, what would be shaft two? And let's see, shaft two is spinning at three times, third order. Yeah, third order. And the reason for that is we're tracking shaft one. And for every one rotation of shaft one, we get three rotations of shaft two. So we call that third order. Quick question, Scott. Yeah. What would happen if I happen to be tracking the other shaft? That's a great question. So if I tracked relative to shaft two, how many rotations of shaft one would we have per rotation of shaft two? Oh, well, it'd have to rotate a third. You got it. So in that case, these lines or the name of these lines would slightly change. The second line here that we talked about would be actually be first order because that's our tracking shaft. And just like you said, we get one third rotation per full rotation of first order. And in that case, we get one third order. So yeah, just like you were asking a second ago, how do we measure these, uh, these orders or how do we get this data? Uh, well, we mentioned that we have to measure the rotational speed of a reference shaft and then everything will be based off of that. And how we measure the speed of the shaft is we use a tachometer sensor. So this so is that's a what those things look optical like. tachometer sensor. I always wondered. And to use this, yeah, that's exactly what they look like, yeah. And to use this optical sensor, we need reflective tape on the shaft. And as that reflective tape passes the sensor, we get a pulse. And we measure that pulse using an acquisition system. So here's an example. This is a multiple pulse per rev uh, measurement. You can see the optical tack here shines a light. And as the white segments of this tape pass that optical sensor, we'll get a pulse. And so again, this is a multiple pulse per rev setup. But we will define how many pulses per revolution there are. And as it counts those voltage pulses, it'll know how many rotations we have. And ultimately, now, why is that the, one line the of a given shaft? wider, that one black one? That's a great question. And we'll talk about that when we get into oh, the okay. encoder tips that are a part of this presentation. So um, this is the demonstration for the run-up that we can add as a video later. But um, if I go here, so usually when we take the data uh, using this, this tachometer that we just talked about, we'll get something called a color map. And this is uh, what kind of normal or real life data would look like if we were to uh, measure an engine or a rotating system with multiple uh, rotating components. You can see here we have the RPM axis and frequency axis, and this displays a little bit different than what we used uh, in our previous discussions. But here it's a color map, and the color represents the amplitude or the height of the peaks for the measured data. So we sweep this rotating system from 900 to 3500 RPM, and we get multiple FFTs in increments. So we get an FFT at the speed of 900 RPM, uh, the speed at 1,000 RPM, so on and so forth, all the way up to 3,500 RPM. And we can define those increments uh, to be really close in RPM or bigger gaps in RPM. But as we get those FFTs, we're going to stack them. And when we stack them, we get this color map. So again, just like we had for our simple shaft example, we have 900 RPM and we have a given FFT and we can see the amplitude uh, here shown in the color. So it's almost like that topographical map you used to use in elementary school, Chris, where the mountains would come right out at you. So the higher the mountains, the higher the map, or the more the map came out at you, let's say. Here, the red signifies, okay. you know, those high mountains or those high peaks. Okay, but where the blue it makes would sense, be but kind of remember, I'm a CAE guy. Does that make sense? So I understand stress contours on a part, and that doesn't look <laughs> like that. And I understand uh, like, uh, you know, looking at a 2D display on the, uh, on the, in a time domain, what I see diagonal lines, I see vertical lines, I see a little bit of angry red. What does this kind of tell me? How do I read this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So just like what we had for the two shafts before these sloped lines that you're referring mm -hmm. to that I'm kind of highlighting with the laser pointer here. These slope lines correspond to rotating components. Just like the shafts we talked about, as I go up in speed, 
the frequency so of like those shafts order. increases as well. Got it. Those are orders. Yep, all these sloped lines would correspond to a rotating component Got or it. orders of the of the reference shaft. And these um, horizontal groupings of color, those are what we would call structural resonances or vibration that is potentially being excited by the rotating components, but the structural resonance is stationary. So it doesn't change with speed. In other words, if I have a bracket and it has a resonant frequency, say in this uh, you know, 1000 hertz range or 800 hertz range, whatever uh, this one might be, that 800 hertz is due to a structural resonance and that 800 hertz Got it. resonance so does not I do a solution 103 on a component, the, I see that yeah. frequency in, in my you know group of frequencies uh, uh, for the for the natural frequencies of the part. I, I animate its its mode shape, but that's what it looks like in the test data. Got it. Yes. Yep. You got it. So if I were to just take one FFT at a given speed, and so for instance, we're just looking at a single FFT during that run up at 1,084 RPM. I can look at the peaks and valleys and the and the frequencies here, but if I were to point at this particular peak and ask you, is that due to a resonance or a forcing frequency due to a rotating component? I don't what know. You I say? can't really tell from looking at a two D display. Exactly. So we want to look at multiple FFTs, kind of stacked, kind of stacked. <laughs> it froze up. We want to look at multiple FFTs kind of stacked in this color map because that gives us the information as to whether or not it's due to an order or a resonant frequency. So that's why a lot of times we'll look at a sweep, whether it's up or down uh, of, of an operating range of speed to determine whether this might be due to a resonance or a force, forcing frequency or one of the rotating components that we're, that we're measuring. All right. So here you can see, just like we said before, these vertical uh, groupings of color represent a resonant frequency. Now let's look at an actual order cut like we talked about before. So here I've got uh, speed versus amplitude and this is sixth order. So this is something that's rotating six times per one rotation of our reference shaft. Uh, the reference shaft RPM is what's displayed here on the bottom. And if I put this cursor here, then I could say at 2700 RPM, what is the frequency? Well, in test lab, in SimCenter test lab, we can calculate that on a second X axis. And we can see just by moving the cursor here that this sixth order at 2700 RPM corresponds to 270 Hertz. And the math behind that's pretty unique as well. So if I have 2700 RPM and we're looking at sixth order, I take that to get to our reference shaft frequency, right? Just like we did before, I have 2700 RPM divided by 60 RPM, and that represents 45 Hertz. But this is sixth order, right? So this is something that's happening six times per rotation. So I take sixth order times that 45 Hertz reference, and that's the 270 Hertz. So I can do that math in the background, or I can have SimCenter Test Lab do that math for me with a second X axis and represent it this way. So kind of to put a bow on this, when we look at frequency and we talked about those basics of sine waves, we can think of orders as event per revolution. So frequency is always events per second, you know, Hertz is uh, one over second. So we, when we talk about frequency, it's how many times per second something is happening. When we talk about order, we're talking events per revolution. And those events per revolution are based on the reference shaft. So Chris, I'm going to let you see if you can figure some stuff out with a fan blade, some more real world examples. Thanks, Scott. So we're going to go ahead and take what we've learned in, the, in Scott's part of the presentation and apply it to a different example. And in this particular example, we've got a fan blade on a shaft and this uh, fan is going to be spinning at 6,000 RPM. Notice we have, let's synchronize, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six blades. So what is the frequency of the main shaft going to be? Well, it's going to be, uh, we've learned that, you know, um, we take our 6,000 RPM divided by 60, that gives us 100 Hertz. 
So that is the frequency of the main shaft. Almost tricked you there by counting out the number of blades, right? So what does the number of blades have to do with it? So we plot on uh, uh, our FFT, main shaft is 100 hertz. So what is going to be the frequency of this is the where it gets tricky, Chris. Pass. Sure does. So again, we've got six blades. So we just take the 100 hertz and we multiply it by six to get 600 hertz. I think my seventh grader could have done that math in his head. I need a calculator. <laughs> and so we plot that on our um, FFT and we see a peak over there at uh, uh, 600 hertz for the blade pass frequency. Now, what is going to be the order of the blade pass? Yeah, it's six, right? Because for every one rotation of the shaft, we have six blades that pass through. Exactly. So the, the uh, uh, order of the blade pass is going to be sixth order. And notice it's independent of RPM. It's just based on the number of blades. All right, let's take a, uh, another example. Oh boy, the hobby I never have time for, RC. This is a two-stroke, two-cylinder RC engine. Uh, it's relevant because of the uh, uh, increase in development in UAVs. These engines get upsized a little bit to fly around <laughs> in the UAV, which is the ultimate radio control airplane. Uh, so we're see there's, there's a lot more two-stroke, two-cylinder uh, engines. Now, uh, and just kind of to, to give you a heads up for two-stroke engine, just a quick reminder, that means you get, uh, for one rotation of the crankshaft, you get the um, uh, firing, the, uh, the cylinder firing to combust the gas to provide power. So if we have a two-stroke, two-cylinder engine at 600 RPM, what is going to be the combustion frequency? Now let's, let's walk through the math. So we know 600 RPM, 10 hertz. So that's the crankshaft spinning. We've got two cylinders. Each cylinder is gonna fire once during the rotation. So, so that means our uh, combustion frequency is gonna be two times 10 or 20 hertz. So what's gonna be the combustion order? It's gonna be second order, of course, because it happens twice per revolution. All right, so let's, let's, let's escalate this and let's throw in a lot more strokes and a lot more cylinders. So now we have a four stroke, which means every uh, two rotations of the crank, we get um, one firing of the uh, uh, cylinder. If we have six cylinders firing, what's gonna be the combustion order in that case? In that case, it's going to be third order, right? Uh, because you, um, you're basically, you're having the number of um, uh, firings because you're firing uh, every second rotation. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, is the, the cycles for the internal combustion engine. We have for one cycle, there are the first revolution and the second revolution in any uh, cylinder, there is on the first revolution, you have an intake stroke where you draw the fuel air mixture into the cylinder. You have an upward stroke where you compress the fuel air mixture and then uh, just past the, the top or over center, uh, you get a firing. Uh, so you, you ignite that fuel air mixture that gives you your power stroke downward. And that gives you um, uh, enough momentum such that you come around the bottom and on the way back up, you push out that uh, combusted fuel air mixture to begin the cycle over again. Yeah. And so if you have six cylinders, three are operating on an opposite uh, kind of behavior per rotation. So in that first revolution, three are going to be just like you said, Chris, uh, in, in combustion or uh, banging, as you put it and the other three will be in exhaust, and they just trade off per rotation. Perfect. Thanks for that, Scott. Yeah. 
Going on to order con another example, let's talk about order content of chain drive systems. Another thing we uh, not only like to test, but like to simulate. And spoiler alert, um, we can get a lot of information from a simulation model. And as the old joke goes, nobody believes the simulation uh, except the simulation engineer. Nobody believes the test except the test engineer. We'll talk about ways uh, on down the line of, of how we can better merge these worlds to provide us something called virtual channels during testing. Hopefully I didn't give too much away there. Not yet. All right, back to our example. So we have a chain, a chain sprocket with 25 teeth and we've got the other sprocket that is 20 teeth. What order would we expect <clears throat> in the radial bearing load? Now, the, the important thing to keep in mind is the, the crank is the thing that's driving the system. That's right. Uh, we're taking power off the engine to drive an auxiliary, uh, and the tachometer is basically kind of a load along for the ride. Yeah, that second, that 20-tooth gear is along for the ride. And, you know, this is the advanced thinking, let's call it. Uh, this is the extra credit, extra credit question to, to kind of test everyone's understanding. Exactly. Uh, we like challenging the audience. That's right. Even when we're virtual. That's right. <laughs> the, so, um, so again, we've got uh, the driven sprocket. The, the te it's 25 teeth means there's going to be 25 hits uh, each time the sprocket uh, completes one revolution, right? Right. Um, kind of like our blade fan blade we just talked about. Uh, the, the tachometer with its 20 teeth means um, for one revolution, for one of its revolutions, there's going to be 20 bangs each time this sprocket completes one revolution. Right. So the top, the top sprocket, the 25 tooth sprocket is being driven by the shaft we're measuring the RPM on. And for every rotation of that shaft, we have 25 tooth bangs. The second gear is along for the ride and that's doing another number of bangs as it goes along for the ride. Is that right, Chris? Perfect. Okay. I hope that's the way I said it the first time, but it's always good to reinforce. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was on the same page. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, our, our tachometer reference is on the 25-tooth uh, sprocket, yes. not the 20-tooth auxiliary. Right. So this means that the 25th order, I'll just jump to the punchline, so the order that we would expect in a, in a bearing load, a radial bearing load, is actually going to be 25th order. Right. And the reason for that is um, our tachometer is referencing the uh, crank sprocket. And the crank is actually the entity that's putting load into the system. Right. The auxiliary is just taking load out of the system. Yeah. It's actually kind of uh, unique to think about in this case, Chris. Because for every rotation of the reference shaft, we have 25 tooth bangs, just like you said. But the other sprocket, even though it has 20 teeth, guess how many tooth bangs it has? It's got 25, Five. right? 25. Right, because it's going along for the ride and it's kind of spinning a few extra uh, clicks, let's say, for every rotation of the reference shaft. The reference shaft is not driving that secondary accessory, just like you said. All right, good, good explanation. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, we've talked about uh, fundamentals of orders. Uh, had a couple of tests and a couple of brain tweezers there. Uh, moving on to the next part of the agenda, we're gonna talk about uh, torsional vibration, including encoder tips. Okay, so yeah, like Chris said, now we're gonna talk about torsional vibration and what we can do with uh, looking at things in the RPM fluctuation. So we've talked about order so far, and now we're gonna talk about torsional vibration. So again, let's look at an RPM signal here. And if I were to show you this, Chris, if I were to show you this RPM signal, uh, what, what's unusual about this RPM curve? What's maybe not expected that you see here in this display? Well, being the simulation guy, it looks like my integrator for multi-body dynamics is going to go really slow because there is a lot of chatter. It's not smooth. It's yeah, it looks messy, right? 
Oh, yeah, bogged down my integrator. Right. And so if we zoom in on a portion of this, uh, this signal, you can see that the RPM's not steady, just like you're saying. There's some small fluctuations that are uh, kind of going up and down. And the reason for that is we're getting a lot of detail in this RPM signal. So I now I'm changing that RPM signal from red to blue, and I drop a second curve on here, which is measured on that same shaft, and that's the green line. The green line is one pulse per rev, and the blue line is 120 pulse per rev. So the reason we get those small fluctuations in that display is we're actually measuring the small fluctuations uh, of the shaft as it rotates. Make sense? Makes sense. Well, the benefit to doing that is we can look at something called torsional vibration. And torsional vibration is the fluctuation of the speed of that rotating component. So even though we're maybe telling a shaft to spin at say 1000 RPM, chances are it's not spinning at exactly 1000 RPM. It's got some fluctuation associated with that. And this non-constant RPM can be caused by, uh, you know, the motion of the crankshaft or the, or the driving gears, um, could be the connection, combustion loads. When we talked about that six cylinder engine, you know, we talked about how some of the pistons will be in combustion. And obviously when that happens, there's a, a quick burst of speed and it may slow down as it goes into that exhaust, uh, motion for that, for that piston and rod. Um, Bottom line is we're not getting a smooth torque on that shaft. And this torsional vibration can also cause problems. It could uh, you know, lead to vibration comfort. It could cause noise. Um, there's durability and synchronization problems that can happen due to torsional vibration. So there's times we wanna look at this and we might, may wanna make improvements on our product. So how do we measure this torsional vibration? How do we get that multiple pulse per rev? Well, we're gonna use something like that zebra tape that we showed in a previous slide, and we're gonna look at all these number of pulses, and we're gonna convert those to RPM like we talked about. Once we have that, we're actually gonna do FFTs or Fourier transforms on the measured RPM signal. And we'll get this RPM versus, tra versus time trace. And kind of what we're looking at, Chris, is this end result where we look at RPM versus RPM. And what we're saying in this plot at the end is we have this commanded RPM and then we have this measured variance in RPM and that measured variance in RPM, just like acceleration or noise can change at a given commanded speed. So you can see here okay. in this final plot where we've got the cursor highlighted at this selected RPM that we're commanding, we've got a pretty big variance going on. Okay. What might cause that variance? Yeah, well, let's look at variance. some of that. So okay. when we're measuring the RPM and we're looking at this variance, if we break it down kind of more simply, we have this uh, RPM overall, okay? So let's say this is that 1,000 RPM that we've been talking about. So we're saying it's a 1,000 RPM, and we're assuming that that's flat. But the torsional vibration component that we're talking about or we want to measure, that's that variance. So let's say this is going up to 5 RPM and down five RPM, which means our net would be this thousand plus the variance. So we're going from say a uh, thousand RPM up to a thousand five down to 995 and kind of varying around that thousand RPM. So the commanded speed would be our zero Hertz component. And then the variance is what we're looking at. And what might cause it okay. to answer that question that you asked could be anything that we talked about in terms of, uh, you know, the crankshaft, uh, variance or the speed variance, or we might be at a commanded speed that's exciting a structural resonance in a given rotating component. So in other words, that could be bending of the shaft, it could be twisting of the shaft, that's just happening due to the physics of its construction. And how we start to figure so that when, out. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, so if, if we see a larger variance, is that an indicator that we have some kind of resonance thing going on? It could be, yeah. A, a bigger variance okay. could be due to some kind of vibration in the system. So to take a step back, if we, uh, you know, if we want to get maximum torsional order, it kind of works the same way as the Nyquist theory when we're looking at measuring frequency content. So knowing the Nyquist theory, and I have a 50 hertz sine wave, Chris, what should my sampling rate be? Nyquist theory, where's that textbook? <laughs> oh, 
It should be uh, 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 four per hump. Uh, yeah, that's actually, it, it will still work. But Nyquist theory says we want to sample twice as high of what we're actually wanting to see. So if we have a 50 Got hertz it. sine wave, we want to sample at 100 hertz because then we know we capture that 50 hertz. The same principle holds true when we look at torsional vibration. So if we have a 50th order torsional vibration we want to look at, we want to have twice as many pulses per rev. So 50th order will require minimally 100 pulses per rev to look at that detail. And the more pulses per rev we have, it's more insight. It just tells us more variance. The more, more pulses per rev we measure, the more variance we can uh, look at. But measuring that sometimes difficult RPM can be hard. For instance, going back to when you asked before, we have this set up with the multiple pulse per rev, and you had asked about this kind of larger section of black here and how that'll affect the measurement. We have uniform exactly. spacing of the black and white segments as it comes across this optical tack, but when it hits this black, as you can see here, it's a larger pulse, which makes the system calculate a reduction in RPM speed. It thinks it's going slower. And so when we look at the RPM of this measurement, we have all these, what we call dropouts due to just that instrumentation. So when we wrap this tape around the shaft, we're going to have what we call a joint or a, a zebra tape butt joint because of the overlapping ends. And it's going to make the segments slightly different in that location. And just like we said before, we're gonna get dips in RPM. So this is that signal and we're gonna zoom in on a section. And when we zoom in on it, you can clearly see the RPM drops out from that instrumentation. So how we fix this is we only want to affect one stripe or one segment. And it really doesn't matter if it's a white segment or a black segment, we just want to affect one segment. And when we have something like this, when we put the tape together, where it's kind of skinny, we actually want to make it worse. So a big segment or a big mistake is actually the better scenario. And again, it could be for the black or the white. Now, if we have something where two segments are affected, we can fix that too. We'll just put some more black or more white there. But ultimately, we just want to affect one segment and we want it to be big enough that the system actually sees it. The measurement system actually sees it. Once we have that, we can use SimCenter Test Lab and we can use something called a zebra moment correction and fix that dropout, okay? And when we correct for it, what it does is it the software is going to look for that dropout on purpose, which is why we want it to be a bigger segment and we want that dropout to stand out for the software. And it will interpolate between those pulses to correct for that dropout, okay? So it's the zebra butt joint algorithm for torsional vibration in SimCenter Test Lab. And once we've done that, we can correct for it. Now, that's for zebra tape. Another way to measure multiple pulses per rev is to use a zebra disc. And these discs can be placed on the pulley. And if you look at my laser pointer here, we could pretend this is the optical tack. And as that pulley rotates, it's going to count the pulses per rev based on the sections of this zebra disc. Okay. Now there's some things we can run into here as well. If I look at these two discs, the one on the left is perfect alignment where all the segments look the same. But if I'm off center, either by the placement of this disc or off center based on the placement of my sensor, you can see here, Chris, that some of the segments are uh, smaller and some of them are wider. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree. Yeah, and so that causes a problem too. Because as you can imagine, when the segments are smaller, it thinks that the shaft is going a little faster here on this side and a little slower on this side. So huh. that's something that we refer to as run out. Okay, so again, if I kind of illustrate this with the slide, those dots, you can see there's a bigger spacing here on the left hand side of this disc and a closer spacing on the, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. There's a bigger spacing on the right hand side of the disc and a, uh, smaller spacing on the left-hand side. So here where there's a smaller spacing, it thinks it's actually increasing in speed based on instrumentation where that may not be the case of the physical part. 
Okay, so we have this off center rotation. And we can correct for that as well by doing something called pitch correction. And this is uh, the phenomenon is called runout. Now, there's some problems with runout. It's on our main shaft, so it's first order runout, right? But that first hour, first order runout will actually affect every whole integer order based on instrumentation. So we get the harmonics. So we'll see a first order increase in vibration, a second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order, so on and so forth. Our real torsional content is actually between the whole integer orders. So we need to correct for this. And you can see after correction, it's a pretty big difference. We have run out in the red signal and the green is with the run out removed. So how do we remove that run out? Well, uh, well, I guess before I tell you how we remove that run out, that run out is not just a function of the disc, but can also happen on the zebra tape that we talked about. And that's just based on the angle of pitch. So if I have, um, you know, a shaft with an angle in it, and I don't put the optical tack at the same parallel angle, then I could also experience this run out phenomenon that we're talking about. But to correct for it, I can use, again, SimCenter Test Lab. And what we're gonna do is use a harmonic filter to remove that first order and the harmonics that we just showed in the data was bad due to instrumentation, okay? So the way that we can do that is we essentially are going to average the signal together at a given speed and determine what that first order runout is. And then we're going to subtract it from the signal. And then we're going to put it back in or what we're okay. Let me start over. We're going to look at a number of rotations and average it together to remove that first order runout and all of its harmonics. The good news is when we take out the whole integer, orders. So we take out first order, second order, third order, so on and so forth. When we're talking about torsional orders, they're usually not whole integer orders. They'll be uh, something like 27.3 order. And we can look at that and it's not affected when we remove the runout. Okay. So like I said, we're going to look at our measured signal and we're going to do something called slow roll compensation. And we're going to average multiple rotations together to figure out what that first order component looks like. Then we're going to subtract that over the whole cycle. So we'll take that average signal and remove it from the actual measured data. And what we're left with is the real torsional vibration. We've removed that instrumentation error. Okay. And so you can see in this sig signal, we rotated the shaft for a given amount of time at a steady speed, kind of a slower speed, let's call it. And then we tell it how many cycles we want it to look over to average that first order component to figure out what we're going to take out of the signal. So once we've looked at so many rotations, in this case, 10, we take that average signal and we remove it in all its harmonics and we get the real torsional content. So Chris, here's the insight. If I were to hand you a torsional vibration color map that looked like this top one, where you can see real dominant whole integer orders dominating the data, right? I've got first order, second order, third order, and they're bright red um, lines that are kind of dominating everything. You can say, hey, there's torsional vibration uh, in this plot, but this plot is dominated by an instrumentation error. I want you to go back through and remove that instrumentation error or that run out, that pitch run out. And then I could do that and with the pitch correction, give you this second color map and you can see the real torsional vibration content. So this one on top is clearly bad. You can tell there's a, a run out problem uh, associated with instrumentation where this bottom one has that corrected for. Actually, Scott, what you would do is on Monday, you'd hand me that first plot and say, oh man, can your simulation model duplicate that? <laughs> uh, we've got some real problems to diagnose here. And then, you know, you'd let me run wild for a couple of days, pulling my hair out, trying to figure it out. And then you'd come knocking on my door and say, <laughs> oops, it was an instrumentation error. That's probably true. That's the kind of relationship we have. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So just to put a bow on it, again, the red signal here is with that run out. The green is after the correction. And you can see there's a pretty big difference. 
what, what I what I found was interesting in in following this is with the with the first with the zebra tape overlap, you intentionally make one segment bigger, right? And that stands out in the data. And then for this phenomenon, you always have to look at that first order thing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So if first order and its harmonics dominate the torsional spectrum, it indicates a runout problem. We use that harmonic removal to correct for that. Okay. So there's yet a third example of how we can measure multiple pulses per rev. And this one uh, is also nice. So these types of tachometer uh, sensors are actually different than the optical tach. These are magnetic sensors and you can see the magnet here. And what those do will give me a pulse when metal comes across that sensor. So these are used to use a gear. And there's a couple positives to this, right? I have an easy setup where I can set this up to uh, count the number of teeth and the teeth are always gonna be easily spaced, right? So I don't have to worry about run out. I don't have to worry about uh, zebra butt joint corrections because all my pulses are evenly spaced with these gears. But if you look at this gear, Chris, it looks like between this gear and this gear, there's something missing, right? There's a missing- Yeah, I was wondering yeah, about that. There's a missing tooth and that's gonna cause uh, another problem that we can still correct for in the software. So the nice thing, a lot, of, a lot of the reason that people will use these magnetic sensors is to get the multiple pulse per rev and it's easily evenly spaced but if I have a missing tooth, that's gonna cause new problems, okay? So here's a typical setup with that. We have this gear and we have this magnetic sensor. And every time a tooth passes this magnetic sensor, I get a pulse that's counted by the system, okay? But when I have a missing tooth, or, or here's an illustration of that. So the, the gear tooth comes by the sensor, I get that pulse and everything's nice. But if I have that missing tooth, I need to be able to correct for that, okay? Because when I have a missing tooth, it's going to show up in the data like this. So the pulses from here to here look different than all the other pulses in that rotation. Okay, so we need to correct for a missing pulse. And there's some things that we want to, to kind of point out when you do that. The results of that missing pulse will not be the correct data, right? Because I'll obviously have this missing pulse and it'll mess with the RPM, right? So you can see the RPM range is bigger. This green signal has the missing tooth, so the, it's a thicker range, or I'm essentially bringing in a variation in speed based on instrumentation, again, that's not really there, okay? Where the blue is the correction for that missing pulse, you can see that doesn't have nearly the variance as the green signal, okay? So again, I have my gear teeth everywhere you see this big kind of uh, difference in the spacing and spike in the RPM signal, that's where I have a missing pulse. And when I look at the RPM from this voltage signal where the missing pulse is, there's a big variance caused by where those missing teeth are. That's not really true to anything in the system, it's just based on the missing pulse on that gear. So there's different sensor types. We've talked about magnetic pickups, we've talked about laser pickups, there's also an ICP laser tack that's available and can be used. The last one that we haven't talked about is an incremental encoder. Now an incremental encoder is good for uh, angle domain and multiple pulses per rev, and it works a little different than the sensors we've talked about so far. This sensor needs to be mounted uh, directly to the shaft and uh, it's you know put right directly in the shaft, usually drilled into it. And the nice thing about this is I can get really high pulse per rev. I can get you know something up to 1800 or in some cases even higher and it has an A and a B pulse train in it. And so if we break that down here, I've got the A pulse train and the B pulse train and I can do multiple pulses per rev. It also has an indexing location. And what this allows me to do, Chris, is it lets me see if the shaft is spinning forward or backward. So I can actually see if there's some kind of rotation front and back uh, to determine what might be going on. So these are really nice sensors too. And again, if I use an incremental encoder, I don't have to do any pitch correction. I don't have to do any uh, zebra moment correction or anything like that because it's all inherent to the sensor. So there's some really big benefits to this type of sensor as well. Okay, nice. All right, uh, again, Problems caused by torsional vibration, we could get uh, durability problems, synchronization problems, noise problems. These are all things that we wanna measure and account for 
when looking at torsional vibration and then uh, determine what's causing the issue and move forward. All right, Scott, I'll go ahead and take over from here. Sounds good. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. So we've gone through um, uh, the fundamentals of torsional vibration. We've talked about um, uh, ways to correct uh, the data for uh, instrumentation problems. Let's talk about a driveline torsional vibration when it applies to a system. Uh, what, what makes it more complex is we don't have just one shaft. We have multiple shafts with things putting in power, the engine, things taking out power, auxiliaries, the wheels, etc. And there's, there's uh, multiple lines. It's connected to structure at different spots. Um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a system level problem. You can, you can test and, and validate uh, uh, focused on, on one component, but when you put it into the system, it, uh, it's gonna behave different because it's, uh, you're stacking up these, these, these uh, different uh, stiffnesses and rotational speeds, et cetera. So what are some challenges to uh, driveline torsional vibration? Over tight, the ever tightening fuel economy requirements are, are driving lower torque converter locking limits. Uh, cylinder deactivation technology, you know, let's let's uh, uh, on purpose uh, it, put an imbalance into the system by doing that. Uh, diesel engines. So these are all market drivers that are that are making uh, development of a smooth, nice feel driveline uh, challenging. And again, it's it's really a system level problem. If we, if we break it down into kind of a, a system diagram, we can say you've got the engine with its dynamics. It's connected with a, a shaft with its stiffness, damping, uh, inertia properties. There's a damper. There's a transmission. That There's a driveline to the differential all the way out to the wheels. So there's all these different subsystems connected with um, uh, different shafts of with different properties, uh, and they all contribute to the system level performance. You know, wouldn't it be great if we had a way to model this? And a way to do that is with uh, SimCenter AIMSIM, which allows us to develop a multi-domain system using a, a set of components from different libraries. In this particular case, we have a rear wheel drive vehicle with a manual gearbox and we want to look for uh, booming noise and clunk. We're able to, to create this system, again, by, you, know, you break it down to that diagram of subsystems, and we can use uh, different libraries and components. So here we have a component for a vehicle, which allows us to specify a set of parameters for the, for the vehicle, and we're able to simulate the behavior of a four-wheeled vehicle with six degrees of freedom, uh, you know, in space plus the wheels, et cetera. Uh, we have uh, spring dampers and suspensions for, for the wheels, and even a, a force relationship for the tires. That's being driven by a, a component model of a differential with its properties, with the drive shaft, with its, this represents a uh, spring damper and inertia. But you see, we've got the differentials, the gearbox, the dual mass flywheel, the, the engine with its pistons and firings. Again, this is a very detailed uh, system model made up of components for the uh, individual parts of the system uh, where we input a minimum set of parameters and we're able to represent those, those physics. And again, this allows us to understand how the system is going to respond due to we're driving around, we're shifting gears, we're, we're um, um, change, uh, changing engine speeds, and uh, validate that um, we're, we're uh, reducing our, our booming and, and clunk noises. And one of the advantages, you know, we always have to validate with tests, but a couple of the advantages of, of doing this in, in the simulation world is one, we never have instrumentation errors. <laughs> True, there, there could there could be there could be modeling errors, and that's that's a different uh, uh, subject. Um, 
but we're never going to have instrumentation errors. And uh, we can always, uh, each one of these components is going to have a very rich um, set of responses we can look at. We don't have to put a sensor, for example, to get the uh, angular uh, rotational velocity of this gearbox. We don't have to have a sensor to get the uh, contact forces uh, in the teeth. So it can give us a very uh, rich set of, of responses that we can um, uh, look at to get more insight. And <clears throat> these, these models can also run real time. Uh, they've uh, developed the, uh, the algorithms so that, so that we can uh, run these real times to support uh, uh, software in the loop, hardware in the loop. But, uh, you know, if you, could, if you could drive one of these, I'm thinking if you could drive one of these models with test data and run it real time, imagine all of the real time sensor information now you could get while performing the test. I don't know, Scott, do we have anything like that? Yeah, it's funny you bring that up, Chris. So, yeah, just like you were saying, this is a nice system model, and uh, there's some useful test data we can get out of this system model without even having parts. It's, it's crazy. Uh, so, yeah, you know, Chris and I get along really well, and let's say, just like he said before, if I gave him some data and he brought it into the simulation, he could, uh, you know, do some correlation and look at it and update his models. Well, we can even do that on the test side now. So Chris could give me a, a 1D model, very similar. And if I uh, expand this here, uh, that fits it. If I expand this here, I can bring that model directly in. So this is our SimCenter test lab software, test software. And you can see I've got a 1D model here. And I'll make this window a little bigger so you can see it better. But I've got a 1D model of a drive line, just like we've been talking about with torsional vibration. And I can click on different components and have those components kind of update. So if I were to look at, let's say, the gearbox, it loads that data. And I could look at different virtual sensors, just like he was saying. So I'll highlight a few here. And then the raw time data displays here at the bottom for those selected signals. Uh, and you can see that's loading here. So I can click through and I can look at some things so you can see the different time signals here. I can even use some of that data. So I can click on given components and I can look at the virtual sensors and the time files associated with those sensors by highlighting it up here. And it will display down here to show me those sensors and kind of what I'm looking at. I can then take that raw data and I could process it. So if I come here, maybe I wanna look at some spectrum maps or some order cuts. Uh, I can load that data here and run it through this process. And then once it's done calculating, I can look at those results. Okay, so once it's done processing that data, I can actually go look at it. So I'll click on active analysis and I can look at a color map and this is, Whoa. yeah, this is all calculated off of that Amosim model that you shared with me, Chris, that 1D model. And then I can look at these results nice. and we can talk through them. And, and once we get parts, we can validate your model. I can use your model to, just like you said, put sensors in locations that maybe I physically can't reach and use what we call a virtual sensor uh, and compare that with actual physical data. I can come in here and I could uh, look at the parameters of the data I could edit parameters based on your model and, and we could share those back and forth and just increase that collaboration. So there's a lot we could do on the front end before we actually start testing physical parts. It always goes to show, imagine the innovation a company can bring that understands both the test world and the simulation world. That's right. And that's probably a good place to end. Um, if you have any follow-up questions on any of the topics that Chris and I discussed, uh, or you'd like to discuss any of the, the um, kind of things that we showed in the software further, uh, please feel free to reach out to either of us or both of us, um, and we'd be happy to have further conversations. Great, thank you, Scott, and thanks, audience. Again, uh, good morning, good day, good luck, wherever you are. That's right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Scott. Bye.